some people are still along the way. Introduction to the Institute. Uh, first of all, uh, a very warm welcome to all of you uh, to this uh, seventh Sial Parik Memorial Lecture by Lawrence McCray. Uh, I'm delighted that the uh, person who has uh, and given this endowment to set up the Institute, uh, Professor Parik, Duke Parik, is present here and uh, this lecture is uh, in, in honor of his father, uh, Sri C.R. Bari. Uh, the institute was set up in 2013, and the primary objective of the institute was to study the social, political, and moral thought of ancient medieval and early modern, perhaps modern India. Uh, our uh, objective was to invite scholars to read uh, texts of ancient and medieval India, uh, written in a language that we ourselves at the center trained as we are in, uh, in uh, uh, disciplines such as political philosophy, uh, history, sociology, anthropology, political science. Uh, we are not equipped to deal with those texts because we don't know the language, the language of those texts. And the idea was to get these scholars to come and uh, read these texts with us uh, intensively over a period of uh, one to two months. Uh, and, and to, to help us uh, understand these texts better. Uh, and uh, after these deliberations, uh, collective deliberations, we were, uh, we, we always intend and sometimes succeed in holding workshops where we invite uh, people from all over India, particularly some young, young scholars, to uh, to reflect on the theme that has been chosen for the day. Uh, in 2015, we had the honor of having uh, Professor Patrick Oliveira, Tim Professor Tim Lubin, and Professor Mark McLeish. In 2016, uh, we had uh, Larry McRae. Uh, Ajay Rao and Christopher Minkowski uh, and uh, the, that, in the first year the lecture was delivered by Patrick Oliver uh, and uh, in the second year by Chris, by Chris Minkowski. In 2017 we had a, we had a collaborative uh, venture between the Arik Institute and the Bagruan Institute, where we uh, where we studied uh, together uh, with Chinese scholars uh, some ancient Indian and Chinese texts over a period of a year, uh, sorry, a month, a month and a half, uh, which was followed by a, a workshop <coughs> on ends of human life uh, in Chinese and Indian uh, worldviews, and uh, the, we were. We managed to have a, a very, very good collection of papers, and uh, this volume will be out later this year or early next year uh, by Bloomsbury, but edited by Roger Ames and myself, and uh, that will be the first uh, volume uh, 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 of, of this institute. In 2018, we had Professor David Schulman, uh, Yigal Bronner, Grace Van Velutat, Gary Tubb, and Andrew Pollitt. Uh, and they, we, we had chosen certain texts from Kerala, uh, performative texts, 
which I performed uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Korea. Mm -hmm. Korea. And uh, that week, that year's uh, memorial lecture was delivered by Yigal Bronner, Bronner and uh, the one which was uh, before that, the year uh, 2017, uh, the lecture was given by the very famous uh, uh, American moral philosopher of Chinese origin, David Wong. Uh, in 2019, we had both Patrick uh, coming here, Patrick Oliver coming here, reading uh, the Dharma. He's, he just recently published his book, edited book on Dharma, Dharma Reader, and we, we, we studied that, uh, followed by uh, Johann Bronkost, <coughs> who had, had, uh, who had uh, uh, written a trilogy uh, of uh, three books. Uh, one was is called The Great, Greater Magadha, and uh, Buddhism in the Shadow of Brahminism, and uh, how the Brahmins won. And we, we studied them for about two weeks and uh, wonderful uh, sessions with him. Uh, then we had a break because of COVID and for other reasons. Uh, and we've now revived. Uh, and this year we have uh, Lawrence McRae, Jonathan Pieces, and Antar Vasti, uh, all three of them. And we've read. Uh, Harsh Charita uh, by Banavata. Uh, we've read uh, a book by Ganga Devi, sections from Madhura Ganga Devi, Madhura Vijay, and we will also be reading something on a Bayadik Siddha. Oh, and and uh, Larry's, as you know, giving uh, this memorial lecture. So, with that introduction, I hand over to Sher Mahiram, who has been very kindly accepted to my colleague and who participates regularly in our weekly sessions and is a very important member of the Institute to chair the session. And if you don't mind, I'll go and set that for the second. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, a very warm welcome also from my side to the 7 CR Parikh Memorial Lecture. And I'm delighted to introduce Lawrence McRae, who's a professor in the Department of Asian Studies at the University of Cornell. Uh, he is a scholar of Mimansa and has also applied Mimansa to, the, to his study of Anandavardhan, so on whom he has a book. And his most recent book uh, is titled First Words, Last Words and is co-authored with Yigal Bronner, and it is subtitled New Theories for Reading Old Texts in 16th Century India. And this book examines Jewish, Christian, and Islamic hermeneutics, as also Vedic uh, hermeneutics. Now, he has inspired many students uh, to take up Sanskrit studies, as also a writer called Summer Rains Oaks, and she's the author of a book, How to Make a Plant Love, uh, uh, Love You, Cultivate Green Spaces in Your Home and Heart. And she writes that Larry explained to her that in Sanskrit, you can generate new words freely, provided you use them as basic building blocks. And this is akin um, to the uh, American Indian uh, languages, where you can also do this. So, uh, so according to her, Larry told her that anyone could make up, make up new words to describe a feeling, an object, or the world. Now, ever since his first stint uh, or, or with us, uh, in 2016, as Rajiv reminded us, Larry has been speaking uh, of the radical rationalism of the first millennia, uh, which involves the Mimansakas, the Buddhist Jains, and the Charakas. Uh, 
Shabara and Jaimini uh, do not even men mention moksha. And Kumari Bhatt also uh, is against the idea of a creator god. Now, this I recall from his uh, from our earlier discussions is very close to Hellenic thought, and you know the Stoics and the uh, and the Epicureans. So do what is best for you. Um, and of course, for Shankara, Ishwar is a uh, is a Maya level uh, question. So. Over to you, Larry. Thank you. Well, India's early enlightenment. And I will also move to that. My arm says, um, the Mamsa was my first great interest in Sanskrit, uh, although I've dabbled in many other fields. But I was struck from very early on by, again, this extreme rationalism, uh, virgin on a kind of skepticism. Is it good? Further? Better? Yeah. Yeah. No, better. Good? OK. Uh, so amounting almost to a kind of skepticism, <clears throat> extreme skepticism about about the existence of God or gods, about any kind of creation or periodic destruction of the world, um, about the validity and status of many uh, texts regarded as canonical by many people within what is now called Hinduism. And I was very interested that the Mamsikas were often described as the most orthodox school of Vedic thought, or the most orthodox defenders of the Veda. And it seemed to me that they were attacking a great deal of what we now think of as Hinduism, as much as defending it. <clears throat> and this idea interested me more. It seemed like <clears throat> the basic facts were well known, but the sort of story was not seen in some way. And in small ways that have gradually gotten to be bigger ways, I have sort of tried to work on assembling a sort of greater story. And in doing so, I've thought more not just about the Mimamsa in itself, but how Mimamsa influences interact with other schools of thought. Um, I'm going to talk today mainly about um, Mimamsa and Buddhist authors, but I, I would make an argument and could make an argument if I had more time that, that during this period, I was in the period from the 5th century till the 10th century in South Asia, um, these are really the two dominant schools of philosophy and almost everybody else is struggling to keep up with them. And I could make a case for that, but I won't bother doing so today. So I want to cover, if time permits, um, <clears throat> five basic topics about what I see going on in this period. What I'm calling the centralization of, of epistemology, the curtailment of scripture, that is to say, limitation of the range of authority of scripture, what counts as authority of scripture, but also what sort of things scripture can tell you and can't tell you about. Um, disenchantment and the critique of superstition. So both within the Mamsa, Hindu, and Buddhist traditions, I want to show that during this period, intellectuals actually become critics of their own traditions in certain important ways and actually reject many of the commonplace beliefs of followers of their own faith um, in ways that follow from their epistemological commitments. Uh, then time permitting, I want to talk a bit about <clears throat> arguments in support of God from other schools of thought, principally Nyaya. And again, if time permits, a brief discussion of the moral consequences of all this. And I want to suggest briefly uh, that the recognition of the need epistemically to start from the ground up and justify all claims through a theory of knowledge comes coupled with, as it did in early modern Europe, the notion of individuals as um, self-maximizing rational agents, right? And that all rationality is conceived of in terms of each individual acting in their self-interest as they best understand it based on their own cognition of the world. Uh, we may or may not have time to cover all this, but this is the plan. <coughs> so, beginning with, wait a second. So I'm going to begin with the centralization of epistemology. I thought I had another page here. Okay. Uh, I thought I had a page where I listed the most important authors and their dates, but I'll just give them as we go. So, uh, when I say epistemology, the typical word for this in Sanskrit uh, for, for an epistemic instrument or a means of knowledge is a praman. Uh, now, in all schools of Indian philosophy, starting in the early to mid first millennium, the question of what is a pramana and how, how many pramanas are there, how many sources of knowledge, and how do they work, what do they tell you, became it began as one topic among others, but it became quickly the central question for all Indian philosophy and remained so, I would say, until the dawn of 
British colonialism, if not after that, <laughs> at least in Sanskrit, maybe in philosophy. So um, the term pramana first, I think, comes into vogue in the Nyaya Sutra, probably the first or second century AD. Uh, the idea of basic your knowledge on pramanas is criticized by Nagarjuna quite early. But it comes to be influential um, in all schools of thought, including Buddhism. And in a way that I'll, I'll argue soon, it becomes, from going being one small topic in philosophy, it becomes the topic of all philosophy. Um, so, again, Pramana is introduced in the Nyaya Sutra, first said source to second century AD. It's not in the Mimamsa Sutra, which is an older text, but in the Mimamsa Bhashya, the first commentary we have, probably from the mid fifth century by Shabara. We'll see more of him later. Um, it's elevated to a major topic of interest. Still one part of one chapter, but it becomes a systematic theme. Uh, to very, well, probably this is the best place to start. So well, sometime after Shabada, probably around 550 AD, we have an extremely influential, influential important Buddhist philosopher called Dignaga. Um, and he writes a work called the Pramana Samuchaya, a sort of collection or assemblage of views on Pramana. He also wrote many, um, many other shorter works, but this Pramana Samuchi was written toward the end of his career. He says he collects here all of his views on Pramana from all his other texts. So, <clears throat> as I said, the question about Pramana is what is it, but also how many are they? And Dignaga provides uh, one very strong argument that there are two and exactly only two sources of knowledge about the world, <coughs> perception, production, and inference of Umana. Um, and that basically anything that is knowable has to be known by one or the other of these two means. Let me just read the passage. Uh, so this is an extremely important passage in the history of Indian thought. Perception and inference are the two that means of valid knowledge, valid awareness, this is a pramana. Only these two, since only two characteristics are validly knowable. So this is important for Dignaga. There are exactly two pramanas because there are two kinds of knowable things. There is nothing validly knowable apart from unique and common characteristics. Unique characteristics are known through perception, Common characteristics are known through inference, as we shall explain later. Very briefly. <clears throat> For Dignaga, perception grasps only unique, unconceptualized particulars, and all non-conceptual awareness is perception. If I look, I see an image, a shape, this thing. Uh, that is perception. But if I see it and I think, this is a hand, this is my hand, this is flesh and blood, those are all conceptual awarenesses. They all attach a linguistic label or a conceptual label to what I'm seeing. And Dignag insists that those are not perceptual and reliable knowledge about, about common characteristics can only come through inference. You can discuss details about that later if you like. Okay. So <clears throat> already we have a radical restriction of what may be known, right? So, and as will become clear, but as you can see already if you think of it, all sorts of things we think we know don't count as real knowledge on, on Dignag's theory of how the world works. Um, just to give one example of this, I want to cite another slightly later passage from the same text that's very important. <clears throat> and I want to show that the turn to epistemology in Indian thought, just as it was in Western thought beginning with Descartes, uh, is linked from the very beginning with skepticism. So <clears throat> he's thinking about how do these two pramanas work? What is it that you know? And he offers two theories side by side uh, that are basically one of which allows for the existence of external objects that you perceive, and one of which presumes that there are no such objects and that we live in an idealistic world. Okay. If the awareness together with its content is the object, as I say, the only thing you cognize is your own thought, right? the image of your own thought, then what one apprehends is an object in the form of one's own self-awareness. So I don't really see my hand, I see a mental image of my own thought. I imagine it to be conceptually external, but really it's just an image. Um, which is maybe desirable or not. If, however, the thing to be known is an external object, if there really is a hand out here, then the pramana for this, the means of valid means of knowing it, is simply that it has the form of the object. So I still have a cognition which has the form of the hand, but it is now conceived of as knowledge of an external object other than itself. So it's a kind of correspondence theory of knowledge, right? I have thoughts communicating images. They correspond to objects in the world, and if the correspondence is right, it's a valid perception. Yes? <clears throat> For then, setting aside this form, even though this is what is self-conscious, so all I really see is the image in my mind. 
Uh, the formata for this is where it is simply that it has the form of the object, since that object, the actual hand, is known through this. I hope that's clear, but um, I want to get the basic idea. So from the very beginning, the idea that we have to begin from the ground up and start with um, what our cognition is and move on to hypotheses about what, what may exist in the world that localizes this already puts us in a skeptical frame, whether they're external objects or not. Good. Okay. So, so beginning with Dignara, um, as I say, epistemology becomes the central topic. He's the first one to write a book entirely devoted to the topic of Pramana, and this becomes more and more dominant, first within Buddhist thought, but later in the IA and other schools of philosophy as <coughs> well. So, what really interests me is, let's actually do the next, which is what the results of this are, especially concerning the understanding of scripture and how it operates. So I want to argue that in Mimamsa and Buddhist thought both, ensuing from this um, turn toward epistemology, there is what I'm calling the curtailment of scripture. And this curtailment, I think, is twofold. It's the rejection of certain potential candidates for scripture as valid sources of knowledge at all. And it's also a very restricted understanding of what you can hope to know, even from a putatively valid scripture. So it involves a critique of other schools of thought, but it also it comes to involve, in the case of both Buddhism and Mimamsa, a kind of self-critique. Or many things that are unproblematically taken as true on faith by one's co-religionists turn out to be dismissed as unfounded and therefore not worthy of belief. <coughs> so I'm going to begin with Kumarala. So Kumarala is around 650, so he's after Dignar, he's responding to Dignar. So he's writing it as a Mimamsa. In fact. And in Mimamsa, <coughs> they do argue for the validity of one specific kind of scripture, the Veda. And they say the Veda can be a pramana, a source of valid knowledge, because it is not authored by anybody. Not by a human, not by a god, nobody. This is not a universally held position, right? Many people assign the Veda kings to particular rishis who are supposed to have authored or seen them. Kumarala totally rejects this, right? Because that's, that's all mythical. It turns out most of what's in the Veda, actually, he regards as fiction. We'll talk about why shortly. But for Kumarala, a truly reliable scripture has to be authorless because all people are unreliable, as we've seen. Um, yeah, that's what see now. This is a great a big maxim. Uh, one of my students uh, gave me a coffee cup with this verse on it. It's something I like to put. So, <clears throat> at all times, people are, for the most part, liars. Just as there can be no confidence in them now, in the same way there is no confidence in statements of things past. So if anybody tells you, the Buddha stood up and said, I sat down under a tree, and I saw the truth of everything, and I can explain exactly how karma works and what course of life you should follow to get nirvana. We have no way of knowing, A, whether there really was such a person as the Buddha who said this, or whether that's just been made up by somebody in the meantime, or if the Buddha was a real person that really said what he supported you, how do we know he's not just a crazy person? Right? <laughs> so because we know that people are habitually unreliable, any scripture that comes from people we can dismiss as unreliable. It could conceivably be true, but we can't trust it. Right? This idea of what, what you can or should trust or take on faith is very important. This idea of what he says, confidence, right? He sum us, right? So we don't know what can we can have confidence in. So for Kabbalah to begin with, <clears throat> anything human authored uh, is presumptively unreliable. So he's an extended argument uh, for why um, no arguments or proofs can be given for the reliability of human authored scriptures. Um, it's an extended quotation. I don't know if I'll quite read the whole thing, but I want to look at this. Basically, he considers a Buddhist argument that we could infer that if the Buddha can be shown to make true statements about things that we can check out through our own means of knowledge, perception, or inference, we could then try to infer that he was authoritative on other matters as well. And Marla thinks this is not a workable strategy for the following reasons. <clears throat> if having seen that an author makes true statements in matters where a connection between object and sense organ is possible, that is to say matters accessible to ordinary perception, if one were to conclude that he also makes true statements about matters that must be taken on faith because they are his statements, let's say, if he's true wherever I can check him out, I can assume he's always true. Uh, so he introduces this very interesting category of shraddeya that which must be taken on faith. There's this concept of shraddha, faith, which was originally a valorized term, and I'm going to suggest, after Kumarala turns into actually a term of abuse, right? 
a rational person does not take things on faith. Okay? So basically, the Buddha tells us some things that we are not able to confirm or disconfirm by our own knowledge. And if we were to just believe him, because he seems to be trustworthy on other matters, we would in fact be dupes. Right? So if one takes this thought, one tries to say, he must be, we can infer he's always reliable because we can confirm that he's sometimes reliable. Then we'll have, one will have demonstrated the authority of his statements is dependent on perceptual confirmation. We can only confirm he's true where we can have another means of knowledge, such as perception. If they are authoritative in and of themselves, then what dependence would there be on sense organs and the like? Why would we ever have to confirm it with senses? Uh, I think I will probably have to trim this a bit. But, um, looking at verse 125 in the middle, one would have to accept, in this case, the truthfulness of state, such statements only with regard to matters that need not be taken on faith. Us should be, right? Where you can confirm for yourself the truth of what the person says. They're un we don't accept truthfulness only in things that are not to be taken on faith. They're untruthfulness with respect to matters that do need to be taken on faith, shraddeya. And the fact that they merely reiterate pre-existing knowledge, just as in the case of the example, as to say, when the Buddha says something and we can check one thing that he says and find that it's true, all his statement is doing is reiterating what we learned from another source. Right? So if human author scripture is sometimes true, it is inevitably redundant. Right? It can only be reliable where we don't need it where we can learn the thing from another means of knowledge. So it cannot be what both the Hindus, what the Mimamsa and the Buddhists want scripture to be, a means for knowing things not knowable by other means. Right? Okay. Um, there's some other rather fun arguments, which I think I'm going to skip. Well, one thing that's important is that Gumaral is already aware and thinking about the facts that were existing in a multi-religious context. So the Buddhists believe their scriptures are true, but they reject giant scriptures as false. So, if you'd rather say that the Buddhist scriptures are true, we still point to the giants and say, you regard the giants, human author scriptures, by an author who sometimes says true things that are confirmable by perception, as invalid, and by the same logic, by inference, you should, the own, you should judge the own scriptures as invalid, right? So each non-Vedic school can be used as, a, as an example to invalidate the others. Since giants don't believe the truth of Buddhist scriptures, Buddhists don't believe the truth of giant scriptures, they can serve as an example in a counter influence against their validity. Does this make sense? <clears throat> and there are Veda, Vedic or ostensibly Vedic schools like Sankhya that again are ascribed to human authors uh, that take contrary positions to the Buddhists and also can be demonstrably true about ordinary perceptual matters. Kumaral, in fact, himself rejects the truth of Sankhya scriptures, which we might briefly talk about later. He's joking a bit, but the point is, as long as there are multiple different human author scriptures that claim contrary things, you can't take any one of them to be reliable. Good. Um, I think that's enough of this passage for now. So, just to illustrate what I said about faith, this is a little bit later. Sucharya Dimitri is a commentator in Kumaral Labhata from probably the 9th or 10th century. And he's referring to these <coughs> imperceptible features accepted by Vaisheshika, these um, particularizers that differentiate one atom from another atom of the same type. <coughs> so the Vaishesh can say, but yogis can see them. Right? So we can't see ultimate particularizers, but yogis can see them. Only people of faith think like this. Trusting people, Shraddhatana. We who seek for reason have no faith. This is a good example of the status of faith in this kind of, at least in the Mimamsa theory. Right? So again, faith, which was very often held up in the epics in other places as a, a virtue that all good people should have, is simply being a dupe in this world, right? If you believe in Pramanas and you look for reasons, faith is no good for anything, right? You can't trust it. All right, <clears throat> so, Kumara offered this critique of Buddhist scriptures in about 650. A little bit later, maybe 675, he's a little bit later than Kumara, that seems to know, we have Dharmakirti, this is the fourth major figure that I'm gonna look about, talk about today. He writes a sort of loose but critical commentary on Dignaga, whereas you'll see in a second, he departs from him on some crucial matters. But he was probably, at least in the second half of the first millennium and after, he's the most influential Buddhist philosopher in India, and, and still to this day probably in Tibet, uh, one of the most, anyway. So he's an extraordinarily important figure. He overshadows Dignaga, who's his predecessor and mentor in a sense. Uh, but responding to Kumarala, <clears throat> you'll see what he says. Basically, he rejects that language can be a pramana language, including scripture, including Buddhist scripture. This is the important thing. It's not been widely recognized. 
Since words have no necessary connection with facts, nothing can be established on their basis. All they tell one of is the speaker's expressive intention. This is a general claim. He's not talking about the Buddha at the moment. But basically, if I say something, all you know is that I intended to say that. That's all you can infer from the words that come out of my mouth. Any inference to actual <coughs> facts would require you to know that there's a necessary connection, according to Dhammakirti, between my having expressive intent and something being true. He argues that you can never know that as a necessary connection for complicated reasons we can discuss. So since words do not operate in accordance with factual states of affairs, the nature of things cannot be definitively ascertained on the basis of them. For they operate only with direct to speakers' expressive intentions. They are invariably connected with this, and hence can cause one to know only this expressive intent. Not all human intentions correspond to the facts, and no one thing can make one aware of another unless it is invariably connected. So you can never infer from what a person says the facts about the world. Now, an objector at this point pops up. <clears throat> How is it then that the teacher, Dignaga, has said that scripture is an authority, is a pramana, and is in fact a form of inference? When he, Dignaga, declares that scripture is inference, since the statements of reliable persons share the general property of being non-discrepant, not disagreeing with the facts. So Dignaga, the author we just looked at, the great Buddhist epistemologist, the author who Dharmakirti is commenting on, uh, says exactly the other. He says that, um, that good scripture, reliable scripture, uh, is a form of inference. So he seems to think if the Buddha says something, you can infer that it's true. Yeah, he, he has not read it morally yet, but Dharmakirti has. So this is Dharmakirti's Dharma response to this objection. <clears throat> the teacher thinks, this ordinary person will not be able to rest content without relying on scriptural authority, since he hears of great benefit or great sin in the performance or neglect of certain actions, and sees nothing to contradict either. And given that such a person needs to be motivated, it's better that he should be motivated in this way. Considering this way, Dignago proclaims the authority of scripture. And what does that mean? That means scripture is not really an authority at all. But simple people, ordinary people, need faith in scripture because not everybody can be a logician. Not everybody can do the work of inferring the real truths that we need to know. So, in a sense, dig not is lying. So what does this mean? This means that no language, no text, Buddhist scriptures, Buddha Vachana, the basis of all Buddhist practice, all meditational practice, all the Buddhist path to nirvana, is not a pramana in the system. It doesn't meet the test of epistemic validity. In fact, um, <clears throat> he argues elsewhere that the best you could get from Buddha Vachana or scripture is what he calls agama ashrita Uma, an inference that relies or depends upon scripture. Basically, the Buddha can suggest to us candidates for inference, inferential belief, but we have to perform the inferences ourselves. Right? We can never take anything on faith. Again, he doesn't use the word, but faith, shraddha, is illuminated from the picture. Right? So the Buddhist scriptures say certain things if we through our own reason, can prove them to be true. We can accept them as valid, but only if we can do that. Okay? But ordinary people aren't ready for that. So we see here something we see shortly in uh, Shabra and Kumarla as well. When you have this centralization of epistemology, you also have a kind of elitism, a kind of gap. A gap between what proper philosophically trained people believe and understand and what common people think. Right? So there's a kind of sense that we have a sort of specialized knowledge. We know the real truth. But other people, simpler people, it may be best for them to be left in possession of certain false beliefs that comfort them and keep them on the right track. Good. All right. <clears throat> so Dharmakirti still wants to find some value in Buddhist scripture or Buddhist teachings. Again, only of this kind where the Buddha proposes candidates for belief and you have to learn their truth by inference. But he does want to maintain it. But again, there's a radical scaling back of what the Buddha can be thought to know. So he's interested in the question of omniscience. This is a different section of um, the Pramana Arctica. Same text. <clears throat> so some people, many people, the traditions of the Buddha is omniscient. He knows everything. He's sort of a nyan. And Dharmakirti, again, rejects this. So it's, we don't need to believe this, and we can't prove this. All we need to know is that he knows whatever is useful. Upayukta sarya. So personal epistemic authority is knowledge of objects beyond the range of the senses and the means to attain them. Some say there is no accomplishment of such objects because such knowledge does not exist. People who worry about being deceived, and then again the threat of skepticism, people who worry about being deceived in case they are taught by an ignorant person seek for someone who knows so they can understand from this person's words. But even if personal communication is not to be taken on faith, you can still look for a trustworthy speaker whose statements will hopefully lead you to things you can prove to be true. But 
So what, what one needs to investigate is the person's knowledge of things to be accomplished. Now, if you're a Buddhist, you want to understand the Four Noble Truths, which I don't need to explain, and you want through the understanding of the Four Noble Truths that the existence is suffering, suffering has a moral cause, the cause can be eliminated, and here is the faithful path to do it. That's all you need the Buddha to know. It's all you need him to be right about. Whether the person knows how many insects exist in the world or not, this is of no use to us. So we don't care if the Buddha is literally on this if he knows how many grains of sand there are, what the name, names of all the stars are, the name of every person who was ever born, all of your past births and my past births. We don't care about that, right? All we need to know is certain Buddhist doctrines that will help us to gain their own. The kind of authority we want is one who makes known the real nature of things to be attained or avoided, along with the means of attaining or avoiding them, not someone who knows everything. <clears throat> Who cares if the person gets seen to the far distance or not, as long as the person gets seen the nature of things we wish to know? If seeing from afar makes one an authority, we would all worship vultures, which are very good So we have this kind of skepticism and a kind of jokey skepticism about believing that the Buddha is literally totally omniscient. And we have this very radically scaled back notion of what the Buddha could even be imagined to have knowledge of, or what we need him to have knowledge of. Good? So. Moving on to part three. Um, so, disenchantment and the critique of superstition. <clears throat> so, I've suggested already that in Mimamsa and Buddhism both, there's a kind of turning back on the scriptural tradition that they're in and a kind of critical examination that involves discarding many seemingly true or obvious or commonplace beliefs about what the scriptures teach and what's really reliable about them. I didn't say this about Mimamsa before. We looked at Kamala's dismissal of he went all through scriptures. But we didn't talk about what he thinks the Veda can really teach you. Uh, Shabbat and Kumarala both <clears throat> take the position that the Veda can only teach you reliably about the connection, the future results of current ritual actions. So if you perform this sacrifice, you will get heaven as a result. We'll see in a second what heaven is. But <clears throat> anything else that the Veda tells you, crucially, any factual information about the state of the world now, about the origin of the world, about the existence and the nature of gods, is not to be taken as true. Right? The standard position of the Imamsa, all the Imamsa, because is that these, these portions of the Veda must be, dis, must be considered as what they call artavada, merely eulogistic descriptions. So when the Veda says you should offer, make an offering to Indra, saying these words, and then it tells you a story about how Indra defeated the great snake Virtra and released the waters that were pent up. That story is just PR. It's just advertising, right? It's not true, and we're not supposed to believe it to be true. <clears throat> Everything the Veda tells you that's factual is not to be taken literally. The Veda is only to be taken literally when it says, if you do action X, you will get result Y. Okay? Which means that the vast majority of the ostensible content of the Veda is, in fact, not held to be true. We'll see that the consequences that follow from this are fairly radical. Um, okay, does this make sense so far? Okay. Uh, the reason for this, or one of the reasons, seemingly, is that um, the reason Mimamsa says that impersonal, unauthored texts can be true is because <coughs> they hold that all cognitions are to be taken as true until falsified, and they hold that unauthored texts can't be falsified if what they're telling you about is beyond the range of human perception. If we let the Veda tell us things about the world, facts, we could disconfirm them perceptually. Right? The Veda said something about the nature of fire and how it works, and we can see that fire doesn't do that, we would say that it is wrong. So we say any of the Veda says anything that would be empirically testable, we don't take that as literally true, we take it as figurative praise. The only things that we take the Veda to be truly telling us are things about future consequences which cannot be empirically falsified or valid. So we're told that if you do a certain ritual, you will go to heaven after you die. And as we'll see in a second, there's no perception gives us nothing about this either way. So Bielamsa holds, whether you think this is tenable or not, that these claims can't be falsified, and they can't be falsified on the great basis of the source of the text either. If the Buddha tells you, do this act, you will get nirvana in your next life. You can falsify it because the Buddha is a person, as we know, according to Kumara, people are all liars. <laughs> Good. So, <clears throat> beginning from this premise about what the Veda says and doesn't say, let's look at what Shabara and Kumara have to say about, um, let's say, Hinduism, if I can use that term. So, <clears throat> Shabara is interested in this section, 611 of the Mamsa Sutra, in Swarga, heaven. What exactly do we mean by Swarga? So, there's several old views, or jockeying with each other, so this isn't really his final position, but 
In understanding the meaning of all words, ordinary usage is the means. And in this ordinary usage, the word heaven is seen to refer to substances. So not in the vein of an everyday discourse, people say things like, fine silk cloths are heaven. Sandal paste, which cools you, is heaven. 16-year-old girls are heaven. It's not my example. <laughs> um, anything that is a pleasant substance is referred to by the word heaven. So based on this co-referential usage, we conclude that heaven is a pleasant substance. So basically, everyday non-metaphorical uses of the word heaven give us this generic, abstractable notion that heaven is something pleasant. Right? And that's all we know about it. <clears throat> now there's an objection. But the word heaven is ordinarily used to refer to a special land where there's no heat or cold, no hunger or thirst, no dissatisfaction or weariness where just good people go after they die and nobody else. <clears throat> to this we shall better reply. If no people go there without dying or return without being born, then no such place exists perceptibly, nor can it be known to exist through inference. So there is no pramana for such a place. If people die and go to heaven, we don't see them anymore. We can't communicate with them. If they're born again, they forget their past life. They forget having been heaven. So, <clears throat> so none of us in this world can have perceived heaven. And there's no way, living in this world with other people in this world, we can infer it either. Right? Such a land, that it's a place, beautiful or not too hot, not too cold. OK. Now, objection. But certain other yogically accomplished people have seen that place, and they've described it. So yeah, the idea is that certain, we may not be able to see it. Normally, people like you and me, but yogis, accomplished people, can actually perceive that they can go there and travel like that. The reply, if you say this, we say there is no authority, no pramana, for believing that such accomplished persons people exist. Or that could describe, or that could <coughs> describe that place after having seen it. Therefore, there is no such place. So there's no pramana, there's no possibility of a pramana. So we should not, we cannot believe in such a place as heaven. <coughs> but the objector says, we understand from ordinary discourse, from traditional narratives, and from the Veda itself that such a place exists. We reply, no. <coughs> the statements of people are no authority, since they can have no connection with such a place. You know, really and the traditional narrative as well are of no account, as they too have been composed by people. So even before tomorrow, we have this deep skepticism of people. You cannot trust people. Even the descriptions of heaven found in the Veda are not meant to make factual assertions about it, but are syntactically connected with other injunctions that are meant to praise them. Again, they are artavadas. They only serve as figurative praise. We're not to take them literally. So even in the Veda itself, if it says, Indra lives in heaven, and heaven is like this, it's so beautiful, we cannot take this as a factual description. We cannot take it as a pramana. So there's no pramana for believing in heaven. We don't believe it. Um, Shabra applies the same logic to his thinking about gods. Now, Vedic sacrifices are typically offered to a deity, by definition, right, to a deity. All of these are what you think of as Vedic gods, Indra, Agni, Surya, Soma. Sometimes they are um, ordinary objects or items, like stick, fuel sticks or something, can be at the time of sacrifice. But when you make a sacrifice, you make an offering mentally dedicated to the deity. Now, common sense view would be that you make a sacrifice to Indra. You say, oh, Indra received this food. He poured it to the fire. That Indra somehow, there's a real being Indra who comes and somehow gets something out of the sacrifice and then gives you the result. That sacrifice is transactional. This seems to be, I would say as an outsider, the view that the early Vedic people had in writing about sacrifice. Right? Seems commonsensical, but this cannot be the case under this theory of how, how scripture works, how it works. Now, <clears throat> You, the opponent, have said that sacrifice consists in worshiping a deity, and that worship is seen in ordinary experience to be mainly for the sake of the one worships. When you worship somebody, it's to please the person you're worshiping. But this sacrifice cannot be like it is the ordinary experience. Whatever provides the result is the motivating factor. So here is the act of sacrifice itself that motivates the performer, and not the satisfaction of the deity. That's to say, <clears throat> when you make the offering of the fire, it's the act of sacrifice itself that produces the good karma that gives you the result of the money. The deity has nothing to do with it doesn't receive the offering, and it doesn't give you the result. On this view of yours, one would have to conclude that the deity both has a body and eats. One cannot possibly give anything to a bodiless being or feed one that does not eat. You claim the deity does have a body and does eat on the basis of remembered tradition, conventional usage, and secondary indications of the name. So again, remembered tradition is like human authored scriptural text, basically. Conventional usage is ordinary people's conversation, and in the vein itself, signs that this seems to be the case. <clears throat> and the argument is very similar. I think I will go through it because it's fun. But, but this is not so, since the remembered tradition to this effect is based on ritual formula and eulogistic passages in the Veda. So people have misread the Veda and created these traditional texts that teach about the gods. 
We know from our own observation that awareness grounded in remembered tradition sometimes derives from ritual formulas or eulogistic passages. So sometimes authors of smirky texts, that's the word in here, get it wrong, right? They misinterpret the Veda. They don't understand themselves how Arthavada works. They think that things in the Veda are factual, but they're not. But ritual formulas and eulogistic passages are not actually intended to convey the meanings that deities, for example, have bodies and eat, as we shall explain. <coughs> You may say that if ritual formula and eulogistic passages are not intended to convey these meanings, there could be no smirthy based awareness rooted. So nothing in the smirthy text that based on them. This is your response. Some people take in the ritual formulas and eulogistic passages only at first glance, and this awareness is rooted in their recollection. That's to say they read what the Veda says or hear what the Veda says, make a snap judgment that's wrong, and write something in their smirthy text that is wrong. But for those who look at the passages more carefully, this awareness is blocked. Veda can. You claim on the basis of remembered tradition, conventional usage, and secondary indication of the Veda, the deity does in fact eat. But this is refuted by the already demonstrated fact that the deity has no body. If the offering really were given to the deity, it would be visibly diminished. Right? You set an offering for the god, and you come back an hour later, a day later, it's still there. Right? It doesn't, there's no bites taken out of it, there's nothing missing. Right? <clears throat> there's no authority for you that deities like bees consume the mere essence of food, leaving no visible diminution. In the case of the bees, we see this to be the case, but not so in the case of the deities. Therefore, the deity does not eat. Again, if there's no pramana, textual or perceptual, for believing thing, we do not believe. However, common sense, it may seem, however, can, however widely held with belief is. <clears throat> and similarly, we say, deities can't own property. You can't give something to a god because gods can't have property. <clears throat> you claim the deity owns property on the basis of remembered tradition, conventionally uses and secondary indications of the thing, all the same sources. But this is not so. The remembered tradition is rooted in rich formulas, same as before, and conventional uses such as the god's village or the god's field are just that, conventional uses. When you say this is the god's house, the temple is god's house, right? Can't be that. Only one who is able to use something as he wishes owns that thing, and the deity can use the village as he wishes. So you say this village belongs to Shiva, but Shiva doesn't come and order you and tell you where to plant the crops and where to irrigate, right? He has nothing to do with it. Therefore, the deity does not care. Right? So deities cannot eat, they don't have bodies, they cannot own property or give results. They can't own anything to give it to you. Okay. Um, I think we're okay for time. Uh, so Kabbalah makes a similar kind of argument about <clears throat> belief in a uh, creator God and belief in the cre periodic creation and destruction of the world. Again, basic conventional beliefs in Hinduism that are all over the Puranas and other sort of scriptures. Even scriptures that Kabbalah accepts as valid scriptures talk about creation of the universe all over the place. They talk about periodic creation and destruction. This all has to be rejected, too, because there can't be a Pramana. This creator god could never be known by, by, as such by anyone at any time. Even if he perceived it as in form, his being, the creator, could not be known. So if Brahma or Pradyapati or Vishnu had created the world, and he shows up and says, well, I created the world. Nobody was there to watch. There are no witnesses, right? Because he created the world. There was no world. How could even the first beings of creation know this? They do not know whence we were born here, nor do they know the prior state of the world or that Prajapati is the creator. They could not have a conclusive understanding of these matters merely by his words. Even if he had not created them, he might say that he had to magnify his own origin. So you can't trust people, you can't even trust gods, right? <laughs> Don't trust anything anybody says. <clears throat> In the same way, even the vague scripture, which being a true existed before him, if it made known his existence, would be called into doubt, and hence would be no authority. If it existed before him, it could have connection. So the Veda is really eternally canceled with a Veda tells us for God created the world. And yeah, just the last couple of verses. Uh, verse 63 at the bottom. This, the belief that the Veda and the scriptures describe the origin of the world, is a mental confusion that people have, produced by such statements of praise. Again, Artavadas, right? They take something that's merely a eulogistic praise of the Veda and they misread it and take it factually when they shouldn't, and they create this false idea and they write it in Puranas and other authors. If pro not properly considered in relation to what precedes, it follows that scriptural language produces a wrong understanding. As we see it, texts such as the Mahabharata, just like the Veda, operate with reference to Dharma and the like through the medium of stories and like, as they tell stories that are purely there for eulogistic purposes and are not to be taken as literally true. And people's confusion would arise from these stories. Since the stories in themselves are in use, in all such cases there must be something which is made the object of some praise or blame, either the Veda itself or the means it conveys. So again, all factual narrative content in all valid scriptures, including the Mahabharata, uh, must be eulogistically praising or blaming acts that you're told to do for a certain result, or dispraising acts you're told to avoid because they're prohibited. And you can't take any of them as factual accounts. 
So what are the implications of this? <coughs> this is written, Kumar was writing in the mid seventh century. At this time, what is Hinduism? I mean, the word Hindu is not the Hinduism, we all know, but what we now call Hinduism. The primary medium for Hindu belief and practice is the worship of deities in temples, right? And it's the primary medium for royal practice as well. Kings are constructing you know, more and more elaborate, uh, expensive stone temples to gods all around the world, making offerings to the gods, expecting the gods to eat them, praying to the gods, please give us something in better. All of this, for Kumarla, all of this is simply based on a simple but catastrophic reading error. Right? They don't understand the Vedas. So this is all basically almost all of Hindu belief and practice in his own time. He's basically dismissing as a huge systemic error. Right? So this is supposed to be the greatest defender of Hindu orthodoxy. Right? So almost everything in the Vedas is not to be believed as true. Almost everything people do under the umbrella of Vedic or Brahmanic Hinduism is a mistake. Right? So what I want to suggest is that far from being seen as a traditionalist who is simply maintaining the, the authority of, of a immemorial tradition, Kumaral and, Kumar and Shabra before him are incredible radicals that are in fact smashing the idols of not only Buddhists and giants, but of most people in their own faith community. Okay. Um, about an hour? About how long? So another 15, 20 minutes? Okay, I think we might finish. Okay, better than I thought. <clears throat> so, next I want to talk about God, Scripture, and Deism. So all through this time, against these great, there, I should say that Dharmakirti also makes very powerful um, anti-theistic arguments in his Pramana argument, which we've been said before. So what I would argue, the two most influential philosophers of this period, you know, 7th seventh, seventh century and after, Kumarala and Dharmakirti are both committed atheists making very powerful arguments. There is a counter-tradition of theism, right? Mostly centered in Nyaya Vaisheshika. And I'm going to look at some of the basic arguments for this. <clears throat> so again, people want to defend God, but they want to defend it within the framework of Pramath. The idea that anything we want to believe we have to have a proof for is accepted by everybody. In everybody in the world of what we would call philosophy. So if Nyayakas want to say there is a creator God, they have to give a proof. And for them, it can't be a scriptural proof, for reasons we've talked about. So they try and resort to inference. Inference is not based on scripture. So this is a little bit before Kamala and Dharmakir, around 600. There are two important Nyaya arguments for God. They're very simple, very brief. So <clears throat> Udhyotakara, writing in the Nyaya of Artika, about 680. What is, should be the, what is the argument for God's being the cause of the world? And we say this is the argument. Primordial matter, atoms, and karma must be controlled by a conscious agent before they can act, because they themselves are unconscious, like an act, though, there's such things. <clears throat> so basically, we can see in ordinary perception that objects don't control themselves, unconscious objects. So axes don't just jump up and chop trees by themselves, right? A person has to pick up the axe. So mat unconscious matter doesn't do things unless a consciousness is driving, right? Just as things that such that such axes exist act only when controlled by a conscious being, the carpenter, because they are unconscious, in the same way primordial matter, atoms and karma being unconscious act, therefore they too are controlled by a conscious agent. So the earth took form <laughs> shape at some point. Some conscious agent must have shaped it. So it's a very basic argument from design. Right? Design being under the most simple sense. Anything that's got two parts that are put together must be put together by conscious being. A similar version of a similar argument around the same time is from a lost text that we have a quotation of it, um, <coughs> like in Avidakarna, around 680 AD. So <clears throat> those objects that are subject of dispute between us, namely the earth, etc., things we want to say, do they have a creator or not? Proceed from an intelligent cause because they are qualified by an arrangement of parts that make them up, just like a pot. Again, when you see a pot, you don't have to see the pot or make it to know that a pot is made. Okay? Pots don't just pop into being by themselves. And the argument is that mountains and rivers and oceans are the same. Okay? <laughs> Somebody must have shaped them. Somebody must have put all that matter together. So it's not even for God, but it's a very minimal God, and it's a very simple God. We have no way on the basically proof to say, oh, it's Vishnu, it's Shiva, where he commands us to do this, he wants us to do these rituals, he wants us to be Hindus and not Christians or Chinese, right? So even if you take the proofs as valid, what they prove is a very minimal value. So this is the only kind of God that inference can give us. <clears throat> We've already seen extensive rejections of this by Kumarla, and I guess I'm gonna give you another, I guess I will give you some of this. <clears throat> so Kumarla responding to this basically says the whole idea of a creator God is incoherent. Because if there really were a God, an all-powerful, all-knowing being, he could have no reason to create the world, and he could have no means to do it with. 
how could the first motion of the world be known? Without a body and the like, how could there even be a desire to create? If he has no body, how can he even have desires? If he has a body and the like, then it's arising. His body is arising. It cannot have been produced by him. So we need another creator for that. If you say his body is eternal, you're faced with the problem that everything else can be just like that. Why not just say all that is eternal? Why just say his body is eternal and he creates everything? If earth and the other elements did not yet exist, what was that body made of? Furthermore, it would make no sense for him to desire to create a world which entails many sufferings for living beings. He created a world in which lots of beings are suffering all the time. Why would he do that? <clears throat> Further, the means for creating the world, namely Dharma and other factors, did not then exist at all. He can't create the world and say, some beings will suffer because of their previous bad acts, because there's no previous bad acts, because there's no previous beings at all. No creator ever creates anything without material means. So again, all of your examples, like the potter and the carpenter, they don't just create a pot ex nihilo out of nothing. They take some clay that's already there, they shape it, and they do a pot. So if your example and your inference requires a pre-existing material means, your creation should require that too. <clears throat> we do not accept that even a spider is able to create without material support. Its saliva, which makes webs, comes from the creatures that it eats. We do not accept that, uh, no, I said that, sorry, it's repetition, my bad. If you say the creation of maintenance of the world is not possible without evil, you're responsible, why couldn't God create a world where it was happy? Well, you can't have a world without good and bad, or good and evil. What would he not be able to create if the means is entirely dependent on himself? God is all powerful, he creates the world, why can't he create a world where everybody's happy and nobody's sinful? <clears throat> and if he were subject to this sort of necessity, he could no longer be independent. He's not really creating the world under his own agency. He's subject to laws that he doesn't control. <clears throat> what is it that he desires that would not be accomplished without his creation? Or what could God possibly want that he would need a world for? Even a fool does not act without some purpose in mind. <clears throat> and if he acts with no purpose at all, what is the point of his being conscious? Right? If he's acting randomly without purpose, why posit that he's conscious at all? Why not say it's an unconscious force? If he were to act for the sake of play, then the notion that all his aims are already accomplished would be lost. God shouldn't even be born. He shouldn't need to play. So he already has the idea of Leela. I think he uses the word Krita, but this theology of Leela he's already aware of. Um, so basically, none of the theories for why God created wouldn't make any sense at all. All right. So my last main topic I'm going to cover is what I see as the kind of moral, moral consequence of all this. So we live in a world where we have certain beliefs, and we're rational. We only accept beliefs for which we have reliable lines. How do we decide and know what to do? So again, we can't take anything from faith. Uh, any human source that tells us to do something, we can't trust. Any human or personal source, even a divine source like a God. There's no reason to believe in God. So on Kamara and Schumacher's theory, there's no evidence for any non-human, superhuman, immaterial beings. Right? All we know is what we see. So we can see humans, we can see animals. We can't see gods or Gandharvas or Yakshas, right? We have no evidence for existence. Scripture can't provide that evidence. We don't know that, right? So there are no superhuman beings we need to placate or who can give us orders that we must obey. All the Veda tells us is if you do action X, you will get result Y. In fact, whether we want that result or not is entirely up to us, right? So there's no external source of morality. And what I would suggest is the basic understanding, not just for Mimamsikas, but for Buddhists and everybody else, is that action is, we act as individual interest maximizing agents. <clears throat> uh, back to Shabbat again, from almost the same section where he's talking about heaven. <clears throat> so the question is, do you do sacrifice for the case of the pleasure that is heaven, or is the pleasure a subordinate element in the sacrifice? You have to sort of seek pleasure to accomplish the sacrifice. If the sacrifice were not performed for the sake of pleasure, then the ritual act would achieve nothing, and it would find no one to perform it. Only that which is for the sake of pleasure, preeti, is accomplished, and nothing else. It's a very basic but universal statement about human anthropology. People seek preeti, pleasure. That's all they do, right? And nobody would do anything if they didn't see it as a source of preeti. <clears throat> um, a much more sophisticated version of this is developed a little later than Kumaral. This is around 720, 725 by Mundan Mishra. It's a very important text. It's called the Vidivik, the analysis of commands, scriptural commands, but it's really a general analysis of human nature. There is nothing that motivates persons to act apart from there being a means to what the actions being a means to what the person desires. People define motivation as a property that causes action. Motivation, this is what injunctions are supposed to produce in your commands. Motivation is a specific state described as a process, a process, sorry, it's a type of, capable of inciting one to action. And this motivation for actions is nothing but there being a means to what is desired. No one who fails to cognize an action in this way will be put in this way will, be <laughs> will do it. So if you don't see something as productive of a desirable end for you, you will not do it. 
right? That's how motivation works. Even activity based on commands and the like relies on the act being in some way or other a means or what is wanted by the performer. Otherwise, he or she would not act. If your king or your master commands you, do this right now, you act because you hope for a reward or you fear a punishment, right? If a respected elder orders you to do something, asks you to do something, you do it because you get hope for their goodwill or the knowledge they can impart to you, right? Everybody wants something all the time. <coughs> um, and I'll just finish, I'll have some closing thoughts, but just to finish the quotations, <coughs> a few more little lines from Kumarala, one of which we already saw. <coughs> For any text or any action at all, as long as its purpose is not stated, who will accept it? So no rational person does anything unless they know what the payoff is, what it's for. And even a fool does not act without having some purpose in mind. This is exactly about why God wouldn't create the world, right? He wouldn't create the world without a reason. Even a fool would not do that. <clears throat> so, to sum up, based, I think, stemming directly from this turn to epistemology, this idea that everything, all our beliefs, all our understanding, all our motivations, all our expectations about action in the world and rewards, must be based on a pramana, right? So we have to have proof of everything. <clears throat> Leads to a situation where most of the claims of scripture, even within the traditions of the Imams and Buddhists themselves, right? So even internally, most of the seeming claims of scripture are rejected as misguided or misunderstandings or based in a kind of delusory faith which at least intelligent people will reject. And we are left with a very minimal sense that, you know, <clears throat> certain conclusions we can draw about what's desirable for us, and all we can do as rational beings is seek to maximize our interest within the scheme of what we can know through Pramanas. And I want to suggest that this is very like, um, in certain respects, the Western Enlightenment, which is to say, to sort of paraphrase Kant, it's a state in which all beliefs are subjected to the most rigorous possible systemic critique beginning from first principles of knowledge. You don't take anything on faith, you examine everything, you exact exactly how do I do this, right? So, so, is this a good analogy, right? I didn't talk about this, but why, why do I say enlightenment? Um, people have talked about Scottish enlightenments, Greek enlightenments, Chinese enlightenments. Um, that's always an analogy, of course, for any other place in time than early modern Europe. But, what's the basis for the analogy? I've suggested that there's a certain turn to epistemology and philosophy, and there's certain consequences that flow from it that bear, I think, a fairly striking resemblance to similar consequences that happened in Western epistemology and philosophy in the centuries after Descartes. But there are certain things that are radically different, the most important of which is that if I'm right about seeing this as an intellectual enlightenment, if there is no social enlightenment. There is no impulse or even thought of extending this enlightenment to the common people who are not Sanskrit intellectuals or any philosophy. There's no sense that we have to warn people not to build temples and spend their money building temples, that we have to liberate people from their false consciousness, right? This is why Shale, I think you wisely suggested like, the Greeks might be a better parallel, right? The Epicureans who sort of say, we understand how the world really works, we understand that most people are not ready for the truth, but we don't really try and do anything about it. We live our lives and know what we know and try to live good lives to maximize our interests, but we don't try and fix the world, right? And for whatever reason, this, I would say, intellectual enlightenment, critical as it is, does not turn to any kind of social political critique and does not veer into that. And, I mean, I don't have an explanation of this except to suggest that one of the reasons European enlightenment did do this is because European intellectuals had to fight for the right to think and believe and write what they wished, right? That's to say, <clears throat> eventually the enlightenment in Europe pushes for the rights of man, the right of free thought, free writing, free interchange. But European intellectuals in the first instance fought for their own rights to free thought and publication. And in India that was never necessary because there was never any suppression of belief or writing at all. Right? That, that battle simply did not need to be fought. Nobody would ever thought of banning somebody writing a book that says there is no God or constructing Hindu temples as a massive error. Right? Nobody never crossed the anybody's mind. Right? People criticized each other. But nobody would think of suppressing books or suppressing thought in that way. Anyway, and that's just a thought, but I think I will close on that note if that seems okay. Thank you. Fascinating talk. And, uh, and I'm going to open the floor with. Uh, two questions uh, to 
One is Hinduism as we know it seems to be a radical reversal of these positions. I mean, the deity can now own property, <coughs> right? Uh, the goddess can even file for, uh, for divorce and alimony, right? So it's, it's, it's just really uh, a, a complete reversal of uh, uh, this enlightenment. Uh, you know, this second uh, question I want to raise, uh, the problem I want to pose, is with regard to Islamic thought. There is, you know, in the same period, what is called the golden age of, of Islamic thought. And what, um, you know, uh, Sari Nusebe has a, a, a wonderful book, um, The Age of Reason in Islam, where uh, Ibn Rushd, for instance, uh, and, and he's, of course, an Aristot Aristotelian, and, and stands for, for, for reason and uh, raises similar kind of uh, skeptical, you know, and, and, and so this is the period and the closure of this age of reason comes with Al-Ghazali. When? That's... Um, 12th century? Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, um, so it seems to me that there's a parallel, uh, you know, and that perhaps we need to see this also in a, in a kind of, uh, you know, cross-cultural uh, perspective, because uh, uh, clearly in, uh, uh, in the subcontinent itself, uh, as you mentioned, the wave of, you know, temple building and uh, uh, the large number of the Puranic texts, uh, you know, which get, begin to get uh, written the Puranas and the Upuranas and you know, so on and so forth. So the floor is open for Okay, can I respond to that verse? Yeah, sure. I've, I've written about this, although it's not published yet. It's in a volume that's been delayed for a long time. <laughs> it was a project with, with Rajiv, but it wasn't here. It was in New York, so you wouldn't have heard it. But basically, I began, my first interest in this really began with where it ends, which is I argue that beginning around the 10th century, um, there is a radical turn towards God. So from this period where Atheism is, in fact, the dominant position. We have a vast rise in interest in extensive, much more elaborate than we saw, proofs of God. So you have in Nyaya itself, in the 10th century, there are three great Nyaya systemic works, I can name them if you like, but they devote far, far more resources to proving that God exists, proving that God is the author of the Vedas, which nobody ever thought of before the 10th century, I would argue. And around the same time, you get, um, you begin to get self-labeled Shaiva and Vaishnava intellectuals writing their own Shastras, not within any recognized discipline. And they also produced very early, each for the city, proofs of God. So in the 10th century, you have this turn toward much more robust proofs of the reality of God. And in fact, you have, especially in this film in Yamuna, in South India, he's the grand teacher of Ramanuja, you have a turn toward the, um, the rejection of the Imams of theory of Arthavana, which is the rehabilitation of the factual content of Vedic and Puranic scripture. And this comes originally in these sort of proofs of God text, but then really comes into its form in Vedanta. And we haven't talked about Vedanta, but I would argue that Vedanta is a relatively marginal discipline until the 10th or the early 11th century. Right? And then suddenly Vedanta becomes one, all schools, of, multiple schools of Vedanta become one of the main forces in the philosophy. And they all, in ways, see themselves as an extension of, of the Mamsa, with the Mamsa, they call themselves. But they all uniformly reject the idea of Arthur. They insist that we must take the factual claims of the Veda. Seriously. And once you do that, right, if you reject that principle of Imamsa, suddenly proofs of the reality of the gods, the necessity of constructing temples, the idea that you can have transactional relations with them, all comes back to the form. Right? So somewhere between around 900 AD and let's say 11 or 1200 AD, this is what I wrote about when I first heard about this. I wrote about what I call desecularization. Uh, you get to a point where 1200 AD, there are basically no atheists. Even, I mean, even people who write on the Imamsa, they have invocations to Shiva or Vishnu or Ganesha and being in the worst space. So they're almost all <clears throat> have some sort of belief in, in a Hindu god, but they write as Mimamsa of this, and some of them still write in defense of atheist arguments, but they're clearly not atheists. So we move from a situation where atheism is dominant to a situation where it virtually doesn't exist in about 300 years. You know? I don't have a good explanation for why. It's a little earlier than where you're putting the end of the golden age of Islam. I don't, I don't see any diffusionist argument there, but I'm not sure. I don't have a good explanation. It's well before Buddhism disappears from India that it begins, so you can't ascribe it to that. Um, 
I don't know. I've thought about it. I don't have a good answer. One thought that suggested to me is that uh, <clears throat> some of the early figures of this turn toward God are also the first people in Indian philosophy who we know are associated with royal courts. And the idea that the turn toward an all-powerful God may be turned toward the uh, adoption of an all-powerful human patron, and in fact we may be making God in the image of the king, has crossed my mind. It's, it's a little out of my comfort zone. It's something that I would argue. I don't know enough about politics and sociology, but it's occurred to me as a possible explanation. And you have the move, you know, in the South you have the move from Brahmins, presumably living on independent Agraharas with no oversight to Brahmins writing within big temple complexes like Ramanuja and Vedishika, right? Most Vedantins are writing within religious institutions, right? Where there's a power structure, right? And this kind of free-willing thing where you can just criticize anything, demolish anything you like, may be disappearing for sociological reasons, economic reasons. Right? Again, that's a, that's a thesis and not something I can prove, but something that crossed my mind. And, yeah. Is it okay to go without a mic? No, no, there's a mic. Uh, Larry, thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, two questions, very brief. The first one, that is it possible to conclude from all the material you presented that epistemology cannot uh, validate or sustain or warrant uh, faith? That much is clear. Yeah. But at the same time, there may be human experience, there may be the fact of <coughs> suffering, etc., on account of which even rational people mm -hmm. can nevertheless choose to have faith yeah. because they don't find it possible to live without it. Um, mm -hmm. That's the one question. The second question I had was, uh, you said right at the very end that, um, you, you know, in Europe, the quest for rights and uh, freedom and liberties and so on may have started because intellectuals themselves yes. were uh, prevented from thinking freely, let's say by the church or by, by other such institutions, powerful well, institutions. Yeah. yeah, and that, that was never the case here. I would probably suggest uh, or prefer to think of it in exactly the opposite way that because knowledge and because uh, debate, argument, etc., were already so highly gated mm -hmm. and so privileged and yeah. so elitist that you know it created a very tight circle within which one had hundred percent freedom, but that as as yeah. as Brahmin males, yeah, uh, and. Furthermore, sort of Shastri literature. The Brahmanas who wrote Sanskrit. Then yes, exactly. I mean, it was it was the most. Yeah. It was it was a domain of freedom, be, because it was premised precisely on um, the unfreedom. And they're free because they're, they're free because they're irrelevant. <laughs> huh? They're free because they're irrelevant. Not because they're well. irrelevant, but because they have done everything to to protect that that space whilst mm -hmm. excluding all others from it. Okay. I mean, I think that's a, it's true that these are the these are the works of thoughts of a tiny, tiny, extremely privileged class of people, all of whom were male, virtually all of whom were likely Brahmins. We're not absolutely sure of that, but you know, certainly the preponderance of them would be. Um, but the people, you know, the people who led the European Enlightenment were pretty privileged white males too. And nevertheless, there were these struck even within extremely highly privileged classes, in fact, mainly among them, right? Censorship and oppression are mainly for elite people who speak with some power and authority and who we listen to. Nobody cares that much about suppressing the peasant of the plow, right? That oppression always, I mean, religious oppression gets pretty deep down sometimes, but I mean, state, state suppression of speech and writing, first of all, only privileged people are writing in India or in Europe, right? So I don't think, I don't think privilege necessarily explains the difference because similar tight circles of privilege were operative in the European case as well. I mean, for reasons we've, we've talked about, Regina and I have talked about, some of the group have talked about, <clears throat> for some reason, these kind of structures of policing opinion and speech and thought and writing that are pervasive in Europe, you know, almost since Plato or something, right? Since, since Plato, the people are obsessed and haunted by the idea that books are dangerous, 
right? If you read the wrong books, you turn it the wrong sort of person, and you become evil or antisocial or undermine the state. Nobody ever seems to worry about that. And you know, certainly one of the reasons we don't worry about it is the books that people are writing are consumed by the tiniest of reads. And I do think maybe it's my formulation, not yours. I think one of the reasons Sanskrit intellectuals, Shastris were left alone in the pre-Islamic period, in the Islamic period, in the colonial era, and beyond, is because their writing is so specialized, and the community of readers is so tiny, that basically their, the impact of their writing need not be feared. Right? They are they're irrelevant enough that nobody needs to bother to oppress them. So certainly really they're, not, they're not trying to undermine the state. right? And the states are not in the least bit worried about being undermined by what Brahmin intellectuals write. And I think that's largely true. There may be a few exceptions. Again, when you get bigger institutions, when you get people in big Vedantamathas doing the writing and thinking, then I think the power equation changes a bit. And that, you know, what the head of big Shankar or Dvaitamathas think may be more of a matter of world concern and may be more of a matter of same negotiation than direct oppression. I want to intervene in this debate. Uh, before I invite Gurcharan, which is to say that, you know, the Charans could freely critique the king. And I've worked with low caste musicians who are, you know, otherwise uh, regarded as, as, as un untouchable, including by their, by, by their patrons, but who are nonetheless, um, and who are part of oral traditions. And uh, which are, uh, you know, and, 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 and therefore they're highly, uh, which are highly lit literary. <coughs> so they might be illiterate and uh, they might not have writ resulted in written texts, but nonetheless they, they uh, have created a body of literary texts in which, you know, the king is, you know, uh, uh, can be, and, and the state can be, you know, ripped to shreds. And this goes for, you know, the Mughal state, the Sultanate. Uh, you know, the Rajput kingdom, uh, and, and so on. And I, I, I have a book on this, uh, you know, from the period uh, the 13th to, to the 19th century and even uh, the 20th century. So I don't think that that's was there clearly any, about... There any, was there any question of oppression or controlling these people? Are they... Of course, yeah. of course. Okay. There's an attempt to conquer them, to, okay. uh, you know, but, you know, they nonetheless, it's a, it's a very vibrant and critical oral tradition which flourishes, uh, you know, despite, uh, you know, attempts at imperial conquest. So I don't think we should just say that this is the domain of uh, Brahmin <coughs> privilege alone. Uh, good turn. It's listening to you, it struck me that there's, in many civilizations, a strand of dissent. Uh, there's uh, skepticism. And what maybe it culminates in this age of enlightenment that you have defined around the 6th sixth, sixth century or Gupta period mm -hmm. leading up to it. But I mean, the, the beginnings are in the Vedas themselves. Mm -hmm. The Nasadiya verse yeah, yeah. in the Rig Veda, the, the most ancient Veda, is a, is, is a, is, is a, well, is a, skept, is a skeptical position. And, and similarly in the mental experiments of the Upanishads, you see the Neti Neti and so on, that same outlook. Uh, <clears throat> and certainly, uh, in the in a text like the uh, the Kama Sutra, it, it's it's a which is a very liberal yeah. text uh, of its times. So I I guess what I was just uh, just thinking is that really all along where we characterize as the mainstream Hinduism, and that in fact uh, makes us stand suddenly shocked yeah. by what you what you've said. Really, the it's it's a it's it's a this may be a culmination of sorts, and there may be any many culminations in the process. But I want to just thank you because I think you brought it all together in in a, in in a in a very 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 nice uh, very nice way. That there is there has been a liberal tradition yeah. right from the beginning in 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 in, in, in uh, the subcontinent and the thought of the subcontinent. I think you're certainly right about that. I mean, you, you, you can see lots of the Upanishads as, a, as offering a critique of 
lots of aspects of Vedic ritualism and Vedic ritual performance. Certainly the Gita is, much of the Gita is devoted to critiquing the culture of Vedic ritual and the obligations of Vedic ritual. So I think you always have dissenting voices. What's interesting to me is that in this period, the skeptical voices, at least in the realm of what we call philosophy, become the dominant voices for an extended period of time with comparatively little resistance. They become the dominant voices. Dominant. They're not on the margin. But you can say, yeah, there are periods, you know, the Upanishads in some way come to dominate over the Veda at a certain point. Later, the Puranas kind of subsume the Vedas and kind of reinterpret them, and that becomes the dominant engine. But I think this kind of self-conscious dominant skepticism is unusual, not to say it's not unrelated to things before and after, but I do think of something distinctive about this period, before, relative to what becomes before and what comes after. Yeah. Please uh, mention your name. Uh, yeah, hello, I'm Malika. I might be asking a very basic question, but uh, uh, is pleasure a purpose or part of the process? Okay. Uh, for example, a bunch of friends are going on a holiday mm -hmm. and the purpose is to reach the destination. Okay. While, But there's a lot of pleasure in during the journey while they're chatting, uh, talking to each uh, other, mm -hmm. eating, singing. So how do we look at pleasure? Again, not, not expressing my own views, but my understanding of conventional views of this period. <clears throat> I would say that pleasure is conceived of as, by definition, an end. Which isn't to say you can have incidental pleasure. Presumably, if you want to go on the journey, you expect something beneficial or valuable to you in the getting to the end of the journey, right? So the pleasure you get along the way may not be your main goal, right? But the pleasure itself is not a means to anything else. Or if it is, if it is, then it's not understood simply as pleasure. You probably know about the four Purusharthas, right? So the general way these things are conceptualized is that all human aims come down to either dharma, artha, kama, or moksha. Right? So all pleasure, not just sexual pleasure, falls into the domain of kama. So the pleasure of chatting with your friends and having a good time. Maybe the pleasure of journeying to a new place you've never been. Now if you're going there for artha, right? if you go into this journey because you expect to learn something that will help you get a better job, or just to get a job and get money, um, and you enjoy going along the way, you could say the artha is, you know, the, the main purpose of the trip is artha, and pleasure is a kind of ancillary benefit. That, that's all fine, fits with people's conception. But people would say, these people would say, why do you want Arthur? Why do you want money? Ultimately, you want money so that you can get pleasure. Now, you can get a better house with AC and good food and servants, whatever you want. And you can use that money to perform religious acts. You can perform sacrifices, which will get you heaven, which is really pleasure in the next life. Moksha is a little bit different because moksha is usually seen as absence of suffering rather than positive pleasure. But <clears throat> some people, um, this important 18th century intellectual we've been talking about a bit named Vaskar Ryan <clears throat> um, says that all the human aims, all the Purusharthas, really reduce to pleasure, <clears throat> right? So this worldly pleasure is common. Artha is what you get in this world, so it's a means to pleasure, right? The only reason you want money or power and prosperity is to, you know, have, be more happy and secure and get pleasure. And he says Dharma are the means by which you get otherworldly pleasure. And moksha, as he conceives of it, which includes a kind of jivan mukti, uh, is otherworldly pleasure. So basically you have the goals, pleasure in this world and the next, which are kama and moksha, and you have the means, artha and dharma, means to this worldly pleasure, means to otherworldly pleasure. So the whole trishir, the whole set four is conceived of in terms of pleasure. I think most people would say, most Sanskrit intellectuals during most of this period and even after would say that Anything that you're doing, if you're rational, either devoted at some level to gaining pleasure for yourself or minimizing pain, right? And often, sometimes they're conceived as <clears throat> different and rival objectives, and some people argue about which one you should wait. Some people say removing suffering is much more important than achieving positive pleasure, and everybody should pursue moksha for that reason. But if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. But that's not to say that they're incapable of entertaining complex ideas, that you can do something for one goal, and you can get a sort of secondary goal that's beneficial to you and satisfies a different Purusha Artha. That totally falls within the system and makes sense to these people. But good? Thank you. That's a question. Question over here. Sachin, you're Me? Yes, that's... Thank you. Jonathan, are you Yeah. Yeah, sure. I um, have some uh, reservations about your characterizing this whole period as an age of enlightenment. Good. I think uh, we have to make a distinction between 
the process of reasoning, the use of reason, and the valorization of reason. And I don't think uh, you have, uh, I was waiting to see whether there was enough in your, <coughs> excuse me, presentation to suggest that Kumaril or Shabad or any of these people were in fact valorizing the capacity, not the capacity, I would say the faculty, mm -hmm. the, even the concept of reason as we, because you have used a word which has a history of its yeah. own. So we do, I mean, if you want to use the word enlightenment, okay. um, uh, and, and in this context, uh, we have to also remember that the Mimamsakas accepted Shabda Pramana. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go ahead. It's not a question of, uh, uh, you know, I know, here but... and there <coughs> talking about a reason. But did they, they was, was there any conscious restoration <coughs> or conscious even awareness? that what went before was without reason. I see. I see. That's interesting. Yeah. So do they see themselves ushering in a new age okay. where reason will be elevated before it was a dark age? What is the word for reason? So again, I, I don't know there's a simple word that cries us to reason. And I think reason as a faculty may not be celebrated in the way that you see it in the Enlightenment. But, um, you know, the Pramana theory itself, which is valorized by almost everybody in this domain, and the way people use terms like yukti and things like that, essentially the way they use yukti contrastively with faith, shraddha, suggests that there is a, there is a differentiation between <coughs> believing things because you have sound reasons, right, arguments, right, not reason as a faculty, but reason as a sort of proof, <coughs> versus believing things just because you're told. Um, I don't think that there's a strong historical sense of ushering in a new, better age. Um, the Imams, because especially, are committed to the idea that <coughs> that good Vedic practice has been around all the time. So they would be more inclined to see to see this as something that has been the the, the, prior, the property of a minority extending into the past. So I agree that enlightenment, in the sense of the dawning of light after a darkness, may not be self-consciously there in the same way. I think that's that would be true to say. Um, I, don't, I don't think that it's conceived as historically a new age in which reason is doing things it didn't do before, although I think from outside we can show that it is doing that. Right? But it's a good point. Thank you. No, I maybe wanted to emphasize the recognition by the Benamsaks on Shabda Praman. Yes, okay. No, so Shabda Praman, you know, and yeah, well, of course, um, you know, the European enlightened people in the European enlightened are not uniformly atheists and deniers of scripture, right? There are upholders of scripture, but again, there's a different belief in what we can hold to be rational in scripture. I mean, it's an extreme case, but you think of Jefferson's Bible, right? Jefferson wants to uphold the teachings of Jesus, but he wants to get rid of all the miracles and the supernatural stuff, so he just cuts and pastes, right? He just slices out all the miraculous stuff in the Bible and just leaves us with the philosophical teachings. Which he still regards as authoritative, at least seemingly so, right? So that there are, you know, not again. There are athe There are people who, for whom enlightenment leads to atheism, but there are people who still retain a commitment to scripture. But again, for Nimamsa, because they are philosophers, because they believe in pramanas, they can only believe in scripture if they feel they can offer a proof of pramana for why you should believe in it. Shabda is not accepted on faith. I can talk about why. Um, that basically, there's there's an epistemology that they believe grounds belief in the Veda and that all rational beings must accept the Veda as true and not Buddhist scriptures. But I, could, I could go into that. I've written about this fairly extensively, so we could talk about it more if you want. They believe they have a solid proof of the Veda. They are not accepting it on faith in their own understanding. I don't know if that satisfies you or not. I don't agree that the Brahman is proof in any case. Okay. But uh, Larry, uh, on this question, wouldn't you think that Arthavad is a kind of attempt to define unreason, the domain no, no, no. of? No, They would uh, certainly not say that. <laughs> yeah, they would not say that. I, but, I mean, I myself uh, personally, yeah, do not believe. I believe that the Vedas are often texts, yeah. and I believe yeah. that the authors actually believed in Indra as a real being who fought a real being. I can't prove it, but I believe it. There were people 
Historically, they did. There were people who held that belief. If you go back to the Nirukta, which is very early, it's before Pani, 500 BC, Nirukta, which is the first text that's talking about Vedic exegesis or explanation, refers in just a few places to people that Yaska, the author, calls Aitihasikas, people who read the Vedas primarily as historical texts. It's three stray references in a very old text. There's no indication there was a continuing school, but at one time, people certainly did treat the Veda as presenting factual narratives of history. Therefore, they clearly didn't believe the Vedas were eternal in the way Mimamsikas believe. Again, much of this is the case. It's not that Mimamsikas get this belief from reading the Vedas, right? They acquire beliefs from their understanding of pramanas and how they work that lead them to reread the Vedas in certain ways, right? So the, their theory of what, what, what can and cannot count as a valid scriptural pramana requires them to only have the Veda tell certain sorts of things. But I don't think there's any good internal reason as a reader of the Veda to think that the authors intended these archivages as merely eulogistic and not factual. Certainly, I think that's true of the Mahabharata as well. But the Mahabharata, because of theoretical commitments, have to take that position. Right? And their proof, and it, for them it is a proof of the Veda, requires that they do that, or it won't work. Gurchan, do you want to come in on this question? Well, maybe not on this specific question. So then the I'll return yeah, to you. you. I'll return to you. Vijay, yeah. do you want to come in on this particular John, question? Only to say something about yeah. reason here, uh, and to also respond to your remark about Al Ghazali, uh, you know, and the Islamic tradition, even Rushd and things. They, of course, take over the notion of reason from the Greeks. Mm -hmm. So, and they have a word for it, mm -hmm. Akal. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and Ghazali, of course, when he is criticizing uh, his predecessors, uses rational arguments and he talks mm -hmm. about the incoherence of the philosophers, mm -hmm. yes. and he yeah. proves it with, yeah. you know, with rational. So, I think here also, you, what it seems to me is that you have this very strong tradition of internal argumentation. You know, and the Mimamsakas here seem to be fighting, as it were, a rearguard action, uh, limiting the scope yes. of the possible critiques of Vedic texts through a new hermeneutics, which reminds one of Kant because mm -hmm. of the, uh, the way in which they take imperatives as uh, uh, not having factual truth content. So, in the sense that if you interpret Vedic statements as either factual and therefore can be dispensed with because they cannot be proved. Or the only valuable statements in the Veda are all imperatives. They're telling you what to do. And that's how Kant interprets ethics also. Ethics is not a description of states of affairs, but is an injunction to tell you what to do. So it's a very interesting way in which they've uh, combined all this. But to the question of reason, the Indian, and uh, neither do the Chinese have any notion, uh, concept of reason. Reason is a construct of the Greek philosophers, and it has political implications, and that's what I thought here, what was interesting was that you were pointing out that there were certain political implications of the kind of views that the Mimamsikas have for the period in which they're writing. When you have a resurgence of, say, uh, you know, temple worship, mm -hmm. uh, donations by uh, these things. So here is a group of intellectuals, I don't know how uh, influential they were, uh, who are fighting this kind of rearguard action and saying, look, you guys are, you know, just talking nonsense. And if you, s because the Brahminical priests must have also been using Vedic rituals in the courts of the yeah. kings that they were, uh, you know, hired to, uh, uh, yeah. I think reading some of these South Indian uh, uh, kings, you know, they import these uh, Brahmins to legitimize their own rule. Yeah. So what were the Brahmins doing except doing rituals there and you know, so that's a really interesting, so there is a politics to the, to this. Uh, I think you're story. right, I don't think you see it very directly reflected in these texts. <laughs> the guy that I mentioned earlier, Yamuna, 10th century Sri Vaishnava author in the south, he is interested in defending again the factual content of scripture against the Mimamsikas, he's interested in defending non-Vedic scriptures, especially Pancharata scriptures as authentic scriptures, as the word of God, as the word of Vishnu. And he's very interested in defending temple rituals against Brahmanical critiques. So he talks about, he quotes a few things. There's a little bit in Manu about this, this sort of dismissal of what they call Devalakas, which seems to basically mean Pujaris, priests who sort of superintend non-Vedic temple rituals. But Yamada in the, in the 10th century quotes several other works that are lost, but you know, these sort of Brahmanical Dharma Shastric basically, if you ever see a Devalaka, you should 
cleanse yourself, right? You shouldn't look at them, you shouldn't talk to them. There's this real attempt at ostracism. And from the little, we don't have a lot of evidence, but it seems like, you know, there's a real, if you think about the history of, you know, Hindu ritual, there's obviously a dramatic shift from a period in which Vedic fire sacrifice was dominant to which temple-based puja was dominant. Mm -hmm. And there must have been quite a, quite a struggle over that for many centuries, right? For, for dominance, a struggle that the, the Vedic Vaidika Brahmins lost, right? The Mamsik has lost. Mm -hmm. Kumaral, I didn't mention it. Um, when he's concerned about getting rid of bad, you know, ruling out bad, extra Vedic scriptures, he doesn't just talk about Buddhists and Jains, he specifically mentions Sankhya, Yoga, Pashupata and, and Pancharatra. So he's already concerned about sectarian Shaiva and Vaishnava movements and producing what for him are fake, fraudulent scriptures and presumably endorsing what for him are fraudulent rituals. So even though he doesn't talk directly about kings are going crazy and funding all these frauds and building these giant temples, he's clearly worried about it. Right? And the next 500 years are exactly the nightmare scenario that he seems to envision unfolding. Right? <laughs> The, the world of the 12th century would have completely horrified Kamarla. Completely. Jonathan. Um, <coughs> I'm hearing from you a little bit more was this transition from deism to theism that you've talked about, um, which obviously uh, took place seemingly outside of the world of Mimamsa, but as we know by, by the world, by, by the early modern period, yeah. Mimamsa itself is undergoing this kind of right. reform. Um, so I was, I was interested to hear you talk a little bit more about this, this shift um, into a kind of bhakti mimamsa. And, I mean, it is Kumarila's nightmare scenario, but it's, it's, it's what happened. Yes, um, yes. Uh, this attempt to sort of, you know, re-infuse mimamsa both with Ishvara, uh, but also with Shraddha, yeah. right, seemingly, again. So. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, mimamsa remains hugely prestigious among many, if not all, intellectual fields, especially Vedanta, Dharma Shastra, Vedanta, Mimamsa is the iconic, you know, it's almost, it's the hard science, right? It's the, if you want to show how smart you are, how good you are, you show that you're good at Mimamsa. So you can, it's impossible to read almost any Vedanta text, any sophisticated Vedanta text of the second millennium without knowing Mimamsa very well. And they knew it backwards and forwards, they studied it. They took it seriously, but certain of its views they obviously rejected, especially about Arthavada, most importantly. So you're right that in a certain sense they're moving beyond Mimamsa, but you know, Yamada, who I think is the pivotal figure here, at least in South India, is entirely devoted to showing that what he's doing is Mimamsa. It's good Mimamsa. If you're practicing Mimamsa pra properly, you'll understand that, in fact, on totally Mimamsa principles of intrinsic validity, it's what the Pramanya, just like you accept the injunctive content of the, of the Veda unless falsified, you should accept its factual content unless specifically falsified. So if the Veda says things are specifically empirically falsifiable, you can say, falsifiable, you can say well, that must be metaphorical. Mm -hmm. But if it says something that you can't, no, the Veda says that there's this guy Indra and he has a thunderbolt in his hand, we cannot falsify that by perception or by inference or by any human-based scriptural testimony. Any testimony. Mm -hmm. So we should, in fact, he says, accept it as true. So to him, he's doing better Mimamsa. He's arguing, we are the real Brahmins, we are the real Mimamsa, right? So he's defending the incorporation of Pancharatra <laughs> scripture into, you know, into the Vedic canon and Pancharatra ritual into basically the role of legitimate Brahmanical ritual. But he's presenting it as a sort of, you know, infil infiltration of Mimamsa, not an not a overthrowing of it. And he still wants the label of Mimamsa as a positive label. If that is the answer, yeah. well, yeah. Yeah. Tarini, and then come to you. I had personal kind of spoke to something that President Dunkar said just a second ago, uh, which is that um, why bother, right? You've rejected gods, you've rejected Puranas, you've rejected most of the factual yeah. content of the Veda. Um, is this defense of sacrifice just, just like social? And like socio-political just to keep the Buddhists out or is it because it's more challenging to keep part of the Veda just as an intellectual enterprise? Well, I hardly would say you, not overtly, right? <laughs> not self-consciously, not overtly, you won't admit that. Kumara, I mean, I'm talking about Kumarala, yeah. right? So for Kumarala, you know, Vedic rituals work. Pancharatra rituals do not because they're made up. They're fake. Buddhist rituals don't. Vedic rituals work. And if you want swarga or a good next birth or a good afterlife, it's rational to do them. Now, in fact, 
could one argue, I mean, I don't want to go the full Fritz Stahl route, but there's this idea that, that if Stahl wrote this book called The Meaninglessness of Ritual, that people are instinctively just do rituals. And so, you know, if you grow up on an Ebrahar and your grandfather and father did these rituals every two weeks, you're going to do them, you know? And it's, it is maintaining a custom, and it's maintaining a belief that the custom has some use and validity, and it's maintaining a belief that the custom should be maintained in opposition to other rising customs that threaten to overwhelm it. Um, but certainly the story Kumarala tells himself is not that. This is not just something we do to maintain a marker and differentiate ourselves from Buddhists or to maintain our status as Brahmins or to get kings to keep funding our Agraharas, right? That the way he would talk about it, and I'm sure the way he believed it, I'm sure he was totally sincere in this regard, is that this, in fact, this is in fact the only rational way to basically handle your, to better your fortunes in the afterlife. Um, we should, I mean, I could get into the question of Kumarala's thoughts on moksha. So Shabara has no thoughts on moksha. He never mentions it. Shabara and Jaimini yet don't even allude to the existence of such a thing. And Shabara, especially in the 5th century AD, to not write about moksha or mention it or mention nirvana is, I don't, I don't know if I quite want to say it's a political act, but it's a striking act. It's, it's something that can only be done as a deliberate exclusionary choice, right? Mm -hmm. um, but Kumarala does here and there write about moksha, and most interestingly, in the Shulga Vart together, there's a passage, I didn't quote it, but it's near or one of the ones I was quoting, where he says, yeah, well, you know, there's no, there's no way you can get moksha from jnana. He says, that's crazy, that doesn't work. <clears throat> there's no way it can work. Basically, moksha is not being reborn in this world. He says, you're reborn in this world because of karma. The only way, and you probably know this, the only way you can get out of that cycle is to exhaust your karma. So he says, you do your required rituals, and your nemitika rituals occasion rituals occasioned by certain events, <clears throat> and you don't do anything kamya, you don't do anything for desire-based results, and you don't do anything for you know, prohibited, which would give you bad karma. And basically, eventually, after a certain relationship, you'll just run out of karma, and there'll be nothing to cause you to be born, and you will therefore cease to be reborn. You won't exist in any sort of state. But his attitude seems to be, well, if that's what you really want, <laughs> you could do that, but there's no sense that this is, certainly there's no sense that it is better than Swargo, right? It seems like you know you're in a you're in a dog eat dog world, and you can either better your karmic fortunes through hard the hard work of Vedic sacrifice, or you can neglect it and wind up with every kind of rotten life you get next. And if you're rational, you probably do the first thing. I think that's his attitude. Does that make sense? Um, this is Jeshwant. Um, so uh, when I was thinking about uh, this intellectual sphere of Brahmins who are engaging with this uh, enterprise, uh, what uh, made me realize was the, sp the historical reality of the spread of Brahmanism. Mm -hmm. How it went from one core in North India to <coughs> our, uh, you know, the subcontinent and Southeast Asia and all of that. So, like in Veda there is a, maybe I'm just saying it out of context, but there is a uh, Vedic saying, Krivanto uh, Vishwam Aryam. So, this, the spread of Brahman, so there was something more than, in, I'm not saying with regard to just Mimamsa, sure, sure. but in the Brahmanical uh, tradition, there was about expansionism, yeah, yeah. about spreading your ideas, mm -hmm. about making uh, those ideas acceptable to people. So, how, so what does that historical reality, uh, you know, do? Yeah. Uh, how we engage with that? I mean, I think by this period, certainly by Kumarla's period, as, as you suggest, I think the term rear guard action is an excellent term. I think it's exactly what's happening. That, that Kumarla seems, and this is subtextual, but I, I believe it, I think he's far more worried about incursions on Brahmanical practice and prestige than he is about trying to expand it. I think just trying to hold on to what's there. This whole ideology of permanence, right, which we didn't talk about, but. Obviously, if the Vedas are eternal, and he draws this conclusion explicitly, if the Vedas are eternal, Sanskrit has to be eternal. Brahmins, human Brahmins have to be eternal, right? So he asserts that what he values socially, ritually, must in fact have eternally been the case, and he seems to at least outwardly hold the view that, well, since it's eternal, it must continue to exist, right? It can't degrade. So he seems, as a matter of faith, dare I say it, to hold that what has persisted eternally will persist. But you get a lot of sense of anxiety, of incursions, especially not so much from Buddhists, really from 
quasi pseudo Vedic, pseudo Brahmanical, pseudo Vedic texts and practices seem to worry him almost as much or more than Buddhists do. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's worried about he's worried about competing with Buddhism certainly and intellectually rejecting claims of Buddhism, but he's very worried about degradation or erosion of the of the exclusivity of the Vedic canon. He's worried about people smuggling in things that they pretend are Vedic. He says about about the Pancharatra and Bhashi, but the text, they sprinkle in little bits of Vedic Dharma in there just to give it the smell, and he uses the word smell, the Gunda, of Veda, but in fact, they're just making stuff up for their own enrichment, you know. So he has a very cynical view about other people's scriptures, other people's rituals, right, where the Veda he holds as somehow different and eternal and sacrosanct and not made up by anybody, and it makes him sound very opportunistic, and in a certain sense he is, but he actually has very good arguments for what he says, which we could rehearse in a longer session at some point, maybe, but... Uh, you know, Larry, uh, I mean, taking Jonathan's uh, question further, I mean, you have by now, there's the world of the Vedic, but there is a very large world of the Urvedic mm -hmm. and of the Agama texts, yes. right? You have in, in, in Kashmir, you know, sort of uh, Pratibhikyana, um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, from the 8th, 8th yeah. to the 12th century, I mean, a bri brilliant array of philosophers. Yes. Uh, then you have Shaiva Siddhant uh, in, in, in the south. Mm -hmm. So the Agama and texts... And Pancharatra. Yeah, Pancharatra and you know, Pashupata and, and, and all of that. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the whole Agama scene is really exploding. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you look at, the, you know, the kind of texts that are being produced and the whole idea of the goddess. Now, the goddess... And if you look at state formation, the relationship between, you know, the goddess and power, yeah. the king, you know. So, uh, so what are, what is Vedic ritual giving you? It's giving you some kind of, you know, yeah. so-called pleasure, but that's giving you power. You know, I mean, uh, 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 you know, th I mean, if you think of that, yeah. that's, that's the substance of, of the king's power. I think this is quite uh, true. Uh, you know, and, uh, and so, um, I mean, I think that that's really a, a much more powerful, uh, you know, yeah. scene. So the uh, so the Agamic, and and secondly, what my father used to call the tidal wave of bhakti. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and bhakti beginning with the Albas uh, from the south. Yeah, yeah a little later. Yeah. yeah, but you know, but that really then defines yeah. uh, defines the the, the second. Uh, no, I agree. Mm -hmm. It's a losing battle. So uh, so the, the Vedic is actually yeah. quite. Someone, no. you know. And again, I think I think Kumara already senses this, right? I think he already he, yeah, he knows about Pancharatras and Pashupas mm -hmm. and he's worried about them. He wants to rule them out. I think you know. I think what's interesting is <coughs> this is the height of what Sanderson would call the Shaiva Age, which mm -hmm. I think should better be called the Tantric Age. But I mean, mm -hmm. it's a world where kings are investing heavily, not just in, in you know in Hindu temples, puja temples, but in tantric rituals and tantric texts, tantric scriptures are being generated. And um, you have a period where Tantra is gaining, seemingly gaining social dominance, prestige with kings, but until, just as you said, Pratya Vijnana, until, until the mid 9th century, you could almost date it to a decade, right about the middle of the 800s, suddenly, a, almost simultaneously, the emergence of self-consciously Shaiva Agamic intellectuals, mainly in Kashmir, self-consciously Vaishnava, uh, Pancharatha Agamic intellectuals in the South, maybe a little later, beyond yeah, the, not the money we don't have. So you have this, <clears throat> so you basically you have a period where Tantra is doing very well, but it's not theorizing itself. You don't have Shastris mm -hmm. who are defending the Tantric world and Pancharatha or Pashupata world. But then suddenly you do. Suddenly there's a market for this, and you have <clears throat> Shaiva intellectuals who are not Nayayik or Zoni Mamsakas or they don't fit into any of the old sutra disciplines. They just, I'm a Shaiva, I'm writing as a Shaiva. You know, you get the, uh, so you get the Pradhi, you get a whole bunch of yeah. different schools of thought, Shaiva schools of thought, Kashmir, you get the sort of Sri Vaishnavism, the Shishtavaita Vedanta in the south. So that you have, you know, um well, this is in Fraunhofer, long ago, if you read Fraunhofer's history of Indian philosophy, he says that, you know, in, in typical, you know, Western fashion at that time, he says, yeah, there were the Upanishads, and everything was good, and then it all got decadent and died out. But then, in the ninth century, there's this explosion of thought in uh, the only sort of new innovation is in the Shaiva and Vaishnava thought of the ninth and tenth centuries. It's exactly that moment. So even, you know, blinkered as he was in some ways, he saw that. 
And then he says, nothing new, nothing original happens then until the British come. <laughs> Sorry, that's what he says. But, which he's wrong about, but, but that that is a crucial moment. And it's totally linked to the rise of these Argonic traditions, but specifically to this moment when the Argonic traditions decide to theorize themselves or develop a kind of Shastric literature ancillary to the scriptures that, that represents, it, I mean, maybe that is the turning point, you know, to this desecularized world. It's, it's certainly the right time, you know. So with that, you have the last question, because Raji has been, uh, Gurchan, can you take a, uh, do you have a, yes. Raji has been gesturing me to close, uh, Okay. Can we, uh, yeah, I'll, be, I'll be brief. No, uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. And while you were talking and during the discussion, uh, I was trying to map what you were saying onto what we know about uh, particularly patterns of royal patronage. Um, and I think uh, what you're saying about the timing <coughs> does fit because up to the 10th century, if you look at um, royal grants to Brahmans, mm -hmm. They're mostly very explicitly to Vedic Brahmins with Gotra, Charana, yes, yes, Shaka, yes. all these things specified and a great emphasis on, on Vedic uh, learning. And then from the 10th century onwards, you have this upsurge of the royally endowed temple. temple right. That's right. So uh, what you're right. saying about the timing mm. of this intellectual shift of focus, although I think Tantra is also very, very crucially part of this whole story. It does tie in with this this, this pattern that we see yeah, in terms of, of uh, political patronage. And yeah, it synchronizes. Yeah. 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 Um, Larry can uh, just have yes. a good turn to answer. Have you answered his, his, that gentleman's question? Which about? Uh, I'm sorry. About you know, the spread of, <laughs> spread of Brahminism. Did I not? I'm South sorry. South I thought I should. Well, that, well that, 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 I don't think anybody thinks about Brahmin spreading at this time. People think Brahminism is collapsing. <coughs> okay. But I mean, my mother, that, that the Vedic period was very different. That at this point, people are worried about Brahminism being encroached upon, and it's a rear guard action, I think. So they're not trying to expand, they're trying to hold what they have. Mine is, won't, mine is very brief, and it won't require any discussion. But a feeling of regret, because, for, you know, the word enlightenment. Mm -hmm conjures up far more than a philosophical position. It in fact affected the world. The moder modernity was born out of it. And the constitutions that we have in the world today g grow out of the notion of liberty, equality and so on, grow out of it. Yeah. And it's, it's just listening to this debate and the desacralization, if you will, um, all that just left one with a, you know, with a 21st century perspective on all this and a, a feeling of, you know, what if yeah. kind of thing. I understand. I mean, I, I understand that sensibility. I understand the idea of this is simply the, the natterings on of a tiny, tiny cadre of intellectuals who don't care about anybody else and don't, aren't trying to make the world better world and don't. <laughs> but there's something, I feel like there's something valuable in this period that has been lost and missed and glossed over by people who read the recent past back into the earlier past. I think people have almost willed themselves not to see how radical and critical these people are. I do think there is some value there. I admit that it's not liberté, égalité, fraternity. Right? I'm, not, I'm not going to endorse it as a political project. I don't think it is a political project. But there's something I find intellectually admirable about it that, that I, you know, not that there's not great intellectual things going on in the 12th, 13th, 15th century, but it's the character of these changes. And I think there's something interesting in this period that people have missed. Uh, so, you know, Larry, uh, let me say thank you so very much. You know, we've uh, had a splendid talk and uh, uh, the discussion uh, has been wonderful. I want to say also in conclusion that I think this is also about the future. Uh, because when we talk about, I mean, here's, you know, the uh, Indic civilizations, one of the great civilizations, you know, uh, that the world has seen. And, um, and if you uh, talk about the Islamic, another great civilization. So I, I think that these, you know, are windows to the past through which we may perhaps move to a better future than, you know, than seems to be the present from the present configuration of, you know, 
uh, political forces around the world. And uh, so therefore I think uh, if we think of enlightenment for the future, I mean this will go far beyond uh, the European uh, enlightenment um, as also, you know, whatever enlightenment, uh, you know, there was in the past in the Islamic world or in what we think of as the Hindu-Buddhist Jain tantric world. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Oh, yeah.